So hello everybody, um, welcome to this um, MEF Connects digital uh, webinar session. Uh, my name is Tim Green, I'm the Features Editor for MEF and um, here we are at the end of the year um, looking ahead to 2019 with various board members of the MEF for the big mobile trends. Um, today we're going to be looking across all of the mobile community specialist areas, so um, we're looking at operators, enterprises, content, payment, issues around identity and personal data, um, voice services, AI and IoT, so a lot to get through. I'm just going to ask the, um, our guests to introduce themselves first, very briefly, and then we'll get on to the discussion. So first, Julian, maybe you can start. Hello everyone, I'm Julian Ranger and I'm the Executive Chairman and Founder of Digi.me. And Andrew? Hello, I'm uh, Andrew Budd. I'm founder and CEO of London-based General Presence Assurance company iProve, and I've just completed my 10th year as Global Chair of the MEF. Excellent. Uh, Rafa? Hi guys, uh, I'm Rafa Colom. I'm from uh, one of the partners of FAS, uh, Trinizet Law at Sao Paulo in Brazil. And I also uh, have been recently appointed as a global uh, board director at MEF. Thank you. And finally, Dario. Hi, everyone. This is Dario Betti, uh, industry evangelist for, for MEF and longtime supporter of the Mobile Ecosystem Forum. Good. All right. Well, I think, Dario, we're going to talk to you first while you're on screen. Um, one of the predictions, when well, we shared some predictions prior to the, this uh, session, and we whittled them down, and one of them was that um, operators would go back to basics and start to um, maybe look again at the content services they have and focus instead on on 5G. So Dario, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about what you think of that? Sure, it's uh, it's still great to be an operator. I think you still can make a lot of money and can be very happy about it. But the the reality is it changed a lot the role of the operators and the focus of the operator. 2019 will probably be the year when uh, most of the mobile operators will discover the joy of a, a business uh, analysis and, and find out how much your network will cost for the next five years. And 5G and IoT will be some of the main drivers. Your top line, your revenue is not growing as much as it's been true for the next few last few years and probably will be true in 2019. So some tough decisions are coming for the operators. Most, most likely, uh, there's going to be a retrenchment, as we said, as in you have to spend more on what you do for your daily job, which is running and operating. So there's a magic number of free, uh, free network operations running in, in each country. Uh, we have seen in the 2000 and 2010, even small countries having four and five operations. This is not gonna be uh, the case anymore. So 2019, we'll see continuation in the uh, limitations or, or sharing of network uh, infrastructure. A lot of thinking and spending on 5G, including licenses, which are probably already we've seen Italy uh, being one of those examples where licenses can be very expensive. Um, so for Verizon and AT&T, we spend billions of dollars in advertising and content. Probably we are going to see them, possibly already Verizon, we've seen them admitting there was a, a mistake. And let's see about the $85 billion spent on AT&T on, uh, on specific, um, uh, on, on buying Warner. But they will need almost a similar amount to invest in 5G and IoT in the next few years. So I expect quite a few of the smaller operators to refocus on what is their uh, core element of running a 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G and IoT network. And within that, be much more creative and focused on their financial efficiencies. Well, um, obviously, some of the uh, operators have invested very heavily in content services, and, and in quite recent years, you know, you think about Yahoo and Verizon and so on, and Auth or whatever, whatever it's called now. Um, and um, so, this would seem like quite a sudden reversal. What? How? Um, how would you expect um, operators to? Um, monetize content in the 5G world, um, as opposed to just um, providing the, the wires and the pipes for others to monetize? So the, the wireless content, the mobile content industry is alive and kicking. It's just has changed quite a few times and it's changed a lot from the ringtones a year to what it is today. Um, I think the most important change and one that I would say will happen in 2019 
is about the, the way customers end up focusing their mobile usage. Until now, the last few years, we've seen a lot of mobile-centric usage. People were using their mobile phones for doing everything, watching movies, watching TV, playing games, anything within a mobile phone. The last few years, um, either because of the big OTT, Netflix, and Spotify, we've seen a bit of the opposite. 2019 will be a very good year, given the amount of smartphone th- uh, smart, smart TVs sorry, that, that, that are coming out. So we are seeing the content moving outside of a mobile phone for the first time. Um, and that could be scary for a few, but not really for the ecosystem. There is one thing with this, uh, which is still predominantly mobile, and that account. Account is the very important thing. Managing your entertainment account via your mobile phone is quite a unique, or any of our accounts. The apps uh, revolution show that it's so easy to actually control whatever you spend, add, and so on. So whether you're working in the content industry, you now have to think of content being used and consumed across multiple platforms, that's for sure. But you can still see how mobile is the center about your activation of services, payment, uh, preferences, etc. So one big important focus for the industry uh, as a whole. Um, and one which we'll see has got some direct applications on direct content, uh, direct, direct Caribbean as well. Okay, well that's um, rather neat that you should give that answer because one of the other predictions that we have is around authentication as a service and the whole idea of the phone as the digital identity uh, for um, a wider array of digital services. And so maybe Andrew, we can bring you in here. Um, Maybe you can just give us your thoughts on the idea of authentication as a service and we'll make mobile the central account for digital services. Look, we're at a particularly interesting time, uh, both as regards securing people's identities. On the one hand, you have a number of regulatory requirements which are driving industries like banks to really harden up the way in which they do authentication. The old methods based upon passwords are dead. The British government say they're going to phase out passwords completely by 2020. And modern European directives force banks to introduce something called strong customer authentication right across the board. There ha- and this, this is going to go through some phases quite quickly over the next couple of years because there is a view that your phone is your identity that actually... Um, uh, the SIM or some certificate that's lodged on the phone or some identity that maybe Apple provides, that is a sufficient proof of identity. But the trouble is that, A, from a regulatory point of view, that is considered one factor in what the regulators insist has to be a two-factor process. So it's great, but it's not enough. And it also neglects the fact that we live in a multi-device world. We live in a multi-device, multi-channel world. And that can mean that there are times when Uh, you're on your phone and there are times when you're not on your phone. There are times when, as happened to my son recently, he drops his phone down the toilet. Now, it's inconceivable that your identity gets flushed down the lavatory together with your phone. So the idea that your identity is totally, that your your credentials are solely resident on your phone doesn't work and most organizations understand that. So the, the mobile phone as an adjunct, as a part of your credential set is incredibly powerful. We're seeing that in the, in the tremendous growth, use of OTP, one-time passcodes, which is really driving the enterprise to consumer uh, text messaging industry. We're seeing it in the, in the form of enhanced services that operators are providing to give um, uh, risk mitigation in when people use their phones and information is provided. We're seeing it in the use of digital certificates inserted on phones, but it's not gonna be enough. So I think we're going to see authentication as a service, which is fundamentally a cloud-based process, and therefore complementary to the device-based credentials that, dev- that, that, that mobile phones provide. We're going to see tremendous growth in that as a way to ensure that people's identities can be supported by their mobile phones but are not totally dependent on their mobile phones. So in the past, there's been a, there's been a thought that there was a bit of a dichotomy, there was a tension. Is your identity verified by your device or is it identified by authentication or service in the cloud? I don't think it's going to be either. As we move into 2019, I think we're going to see the, 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 synth- the, the synthesis of those two. And authentication as a service is going to take going to play an incredibly important role in helping people to ensure that they can safely assert their identity, whatever, wherever they are and whatever device they're on, 
And I think that it is inevitable that that authentication as a service, because it's got to be uh, complementary to and distinct from device-based authentication, is inevitably going to be based on biometrics. We're going to see an explosion, I think, in the use of uh, face and other biometrics um, in 2019 delivered through authentication as a service. So uh, just to clarify for that then, so you're saying that um, there needs to be some cloud-based identity so that you're not um, completely married to the phone in case it falls down the toilet, um, but you need to marry that with uh, some kind of on-device thing. So what, what happens if your phone goes down the toilet to your on-device you know, piece of that, of that uh, equation? I think there are always a number of collateral pieces of information, a number of collateral pieces of credential. So it doesn't, for example, just have to be on one device. Yeah. You can have, you can, you can provide uh, corroboration through a number of different possible devices. That's why the idea that your ident that there's a one-to-one -one relationship between your device and your identity, I think, is fundamentally wrong. Uh, it can be possession, proximity to a number of different other devices. We know how, for example. Um, your, your many mobile phones will unlock when in Bluetooth in proximity to something else, which is a personally, which is known to be a personally owned uh, object. That same kind of cooperation can be used, um, uh, for example, to corroborate an identity. So there can be lots of things, lots of possessions right. that help corroborate your identity, not just your mobile phone. And do you think we could start to see the um, the, the emergence of some of the uh, the kind of more innovative um, authenticated ideas around the orientation of your phone, um, or clearly the location of it, um, maybe the way that you sign your name or even press the keypad. So we've heard about all these kinds of ideas. Do you think we'll start to see some of those come on stream? I, I think so to a degree, but there's a, there's a, a, a great, we live in a world in which um, cyber attackers must be treated with respect. Gone are the days when we were dealing with kids, just with kids in their bedrooms, having a bit of fun. We're dealing with uh, criminal organizations with large resources motivated by compelling criminal business models uh, who are able to invest significant resources in uh, attacking the identity cooperation systems out there and then uh, reselling them multiply through the dark web. So we must, we must um, treat them with respect. So for example, location-based solutions, um, if the, net the network operators have a tremendous asset in their location services because they are not subject to hacking whereas device-based location services that is reading the gps information of your handset are almost laughably easy to hack well if something is very if it's well known how you hack a, an authentication method in a way it's a bit noxious to use it because all you're really doing is you're trapping the idiots you're not really catching the people you're not going to spot the people who are genuinely determined and it lulls you into a false sense of security so there are some methods that I think will fall out of favor, such as device-based location. Network-based location is a tremendous asset, but we've seen problems in the United States. So a number of the US operators have been forced by um, privacy issues and recent public fury to pull back from offering lo network-based location services just for the moment when it's at its most useful. And I'm sure, I hope, and I think we'll see a reversal of that in 2019. The more behavioral methods are, again, they're very complementary. Behavior is not a good way of authenticating someone because there are moments in a transaction when you need to have a high degree of security, whether the identity that a person is supporting is or is not them. But then it's very useful to have methods of mitigating the risk as the transaction goes on and over time. And these yeah. behavioral methods, they don't provide good, strong binary yes, no's, generally speaking. They provide risk indicators, which are tremendously valuable and useful. Yeah. Um, in the same way that location doesn't provide a clear yes, no as to whether this is a person, but it does provide, if it can't be corrupted, it does provide a very good indicator that maybe uh, the risk is mitigated. Okay, thank you, Andrew. You mentioned privacy there, and that brings us on to uh, another important topic, um, which was obviously the big talking point, one of the big talking points of 2018 was GDPR. Julian, I know one of your forecasts for next year was that GD, we start to see uh, laws similar to GDPR being um, launched across the world. So maybe you can tell us your thoughts on that and we'll also bring Rafa in as well when you've finished giving us your thoughts. So Julian. Yes, so GDPR has come in. Um, it's primarily been a compliance issue this year. You'll see that change as we go through 2019 when people are looking at what advantages 
does it bring and, and how does that change the business models? And I'll talk about that in a minute. But the essential elements of GDPR we're now seeing being copied worldwide, uh, being brought up in laws in California, Brazil. We've got the consumer data right in Australia. And you're going to see more of that. We're going to see, as we've seen before, that privacy legislation tends to the maximum. And if one country starts it like Canada, it then flows around the world and then so on and so forth. So clearly, we are going to see GDPR emulated around the world. There will be regional differences uh, without a, a shadow of a doubt. So some slight changes in each of these places. But the primary features of individual control, um, explicit informed consent, and data portability particularly, will apply across all of those regions. So we'll start to see some commonality. What that means basically is the original idea that you would do something different for Europe and carry on doing other things around the world will steadily go away. Like uh, it has been in the past, we'll see that it's better just to meet the highest standards and apply that worldwide. And that's the, the primary impact that that will show. There's going to be um, some interesting uh, developments in GDPR next year in that we'll have those first privacy related lawsuits coming through and there'll be quite a few of those uh, they will go after initially the bigger targets um, they're not going to hit public consciousness most public uh, people of the public will not even be aware of quite why uh, particular lawsuits are going but in the aggregate it will reinforce the movement away from using tracked and background data, without a doubt. So individually, um, there'll be a lot of confusion, but in aggregate, we'll see that that reinforces things and provides some clarity, which we haven't had this year. Um, and so while some people have adopted a bit of a wait and see, trying to carry on, that clarity will put a sharper focus onto what the real rules are next year um how do you personally feel about gdpr as a piece of legislation because i was at a presentation recently and they were talking about the fact that the, the speaker said that uh, they would been speaking to a media publishing group and they'd had two requests for data port um porting since um from from members of the public since uh, the law was introduced so for all of the you know the little warnings we're getting and the, the tick boxes we're getting at the beginning of our digital journeys is anyone really engaging with it is it hitting home no I, and let's be honest with things like gdpr the public themselves don't really get involved until new services come about as a result of them so you know legislation doesn't suddenly beget a whole load of public interest what it begets is new business models differing business models so sure not many individuals are going to stick their hand up and say hey give me back my data um, not on day one because what are they supposed to do with it if you look at gdpr data has to be uh, portable electronic and in a form available for reuse well if it's electronic and in a form available for reuse by definition most of the public are not programmers or computer savvy they're not going to know what to do with the data by definition mm. but because that data is now available there'll be new services uh, mine is one but there's lots of others that will come through who will help users get the data in a form that they can reuse and then help connect that data with new companies that want to use it and the beauty here is that you can now bring health and mix it with finance or social and vice versa a whole new series of things but until those new services start being put out there individuals are not going to understand that personal control is giving them something different. In other words, there wasn't a scream from the heaven saying, give me personal control. But in understanding that it will make a change, that it does make better data available, as those new services come, then that understanding will come. And that's the same with seatbelts, if you like. Seatbelts came in to cars only on the driver's seat it took quite a while before we said let's have them on the passenger and the, the rear seats and before everybody knew to clunk click every trip um, as they say so these things take time but I think it won't take so long 
because there are many new services that are coming that will be transformational in health, in finance, in businesses. And once you see those, we know how much of a marginal difference it makes to businesses having relatively poor track data about the individual, right? Everybody's been at it because it makes a difference. The difference you get when you get really accurate data volunteered by the individual is going to be huge for businesses um, across all domains. And so whilst GDPR may have limited direct effect in the minds of the consumer right now, as soon as those big difference applications and value experiences start appearing, it'll be very rapid. Okay, so Rafa, maybe you can tell us, um, as someone with an overview of uh, the legislation in Latin America, what, what are your feelings about the emulation of GDPR around the world? Well, uh, GDPR expectedly became the golden standard for uh, privacy regulations. What we are seeing right now is like this, uh, this race to put and to implement uh, similar legislation uh, in Latin American countries. Uh, Brazil's uh, new privacy law that is gonna be effective in the early beginnings of 2020 uh, means that in the next year, we are going to probably spend the whole year, uh, first of all, trying to understand how to comply with all of those rules. And if, if, if it somehow stiffs competition or not, and, and innovation or not, because uh, as in the GDPR, we are not setting any levels of compliance for companies. So even uh, startups and smaller companies have to comply in full with the, the whole set of regulation that we've, we've approved. Um, and then we have countries like Mexico, Argentina, and Chile, like the other uh, big economies of the region, uh, also emulating some GDPR-like uh, regulation. Uh, they are now mostly uh, not really discussing because uh, as Julian mentioned, uh, this is not something that uh, created a lot of engagement with uh, the real person, uh, the real Joe working uh, on, on their, their business. Uh, what we have right now is a lot of uh, concern from both legislators, uh, engagement from tech companies and tech savvy companies. And at the same time, uh, scholars and students and NGOs that are worried and concerned about privacy as an issue in Brazil and, and in Latin America. So it's mostly a niche uh, and it, it's been mostly a compliance issue as Julian mentioned as well. But uh, we are starting to see like the real cases uh, approaching the reality right now. So we're starting to see uh, public attorneys and NGOs uh, issuing and starting lawsuits against uh, practices that have been done in the, the last couple of years without any concern from users. So uh, the real take right now is uh, concern about privacy is really high. Uh, people are starting to decide on what kind of companies they're going to engage in and, and agree with whenever uh, there's any privacy regulation or not. Uh, we are starting to see major uh, privacy breaches in Brazil and Argentina as well. Uh, and right now we are starting to see companies trying to move towards a, a more uh, strategic approach to privacy where they believe having uh, clear and, and correct privacy standards and guidelines will probably be beneficial for them in the near future. Uh, not just because they are in compliance with the law, but because they are comp their, their competitors aren't. So yeah. uh, the ones who are starting uh, at first will be probably the ones who are going to be chosen by consumers at the, uh, during, last, during next year and probably after 2020 when, when the law goes in, in an effective way. Okay. And, and this um, is what we see with the MEF trust study as well, of course. The trust is an issue and over the years, so five years ago, we see people weren't taking actions, but they're taking more and more actions. Although it's a negative action, but if you've got trust, that keeps and attracts the users to you. And I think, so that's the first impact of something like GDPR highlights the trust aspects that Rafa has been saying. 
But the second piece is when the realization comes that by having the trust, you actually end up getting better data direct from the individual, and then you can do more. Uh, that piece is what will really come to the fore in 2019. So that will make the, the tipping point change. So people see that trust is a good thing to go after now, when you see that it then gives you better information and able to do more, then there's a real, real business compelling reason for, for flowing yeah, down. Yeah. Um, I mean, one um, special thing here is uh, we have a highly regulated industry in the financial services industry, uh, telecom services as well, and health services. And uh, strangely enough, because of all of that regulation, uh, we, we didn't have any major breaches uh, of databases or any major privacy breaches because there are so many regulation already. Uh, companies are positioning themselves as the champions of user privacy already. So uh, that's becoming clearer and clearer as more startups and new, uh, new companies coming up to these environments, trying to disrupt these industries uh, more and more suffer uh, with data breaches all the time so um what julian said is the is, is very important which is that it's one thing to have le anti-privacy legislation and to have companies becoming aware of the benefit of, of respecting people's privacy but it's more important to have service that that actually do more for the consumer and um enable enterprises to get better information and you know offer better services that's that's the the real point that's what's going to make this fly so in brazil do you have any companies like digime um that are trying to promote this new idea of of sharing data with brand new trust in a in a trustworthy way uh we have some companies on the the person of in the personal identity managers industry uh already coming to brazil uh, first of all, working uh, with the big database holders like uh, telecom services, financial services, health services, uh, insurance services as well. Uh, so we are starting to see those uh, coming in. Right now, we still have this, uh, probably it's a cultural issue of uh, Brazil. Uh, these companies usually don't allow uh, their databases and their clients to, to share information. Of course, this is something that is going to change with the, the new privacy law. So we are going to see during the next year this shift in, in the environment where uh, these big companies would basically keep the databases to themselves and not really uh, transact personal data uh, to a, a more friendly environment, probably, where we have uh, third parties managing this kind of information. So there's already one company trying to work with banks and insurance companies here. Uh, they're doing, right now, they are spending their, their time uh, in trying to evangelize uh, the, the banks and insurance companies in Brazil on how to trust uh, that a third party would be uh, good enough to do the job uh, and would probably uh, move this database towards uh, the 21st century and its technologies because there's still a lot of uh, technology that is from the 80s and 90s. So there's a lot of legacy. Yeah, yeah. In, they still believe a lot in, in the legacy services and legacy ways of uh, storing and managing data. So of course, this has to change because they, they need to be more agile on, on their databases. All right, so one of, the, um, one of the bits of feedback we had when we were asking about predictions for 2019 was from Julian. Um, and his prediction was that terms like my data, Internet of Me, etc., will move towards the mainstream in 2019. And these are obviously terms that um, describe the idea that um, customers are going to start sharing their own data with brands they trust on their own terms. So, Julian, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your thoughts on that topic. I think there's going to be sharper focus on the debate of does privacy inhibit innovation? which has been sort of the legacy viewpoint and the viewpoint that came out in 18 because, well, it meant we had to do less. We, it meant we lost our email lists and things like that. And I think you'll see a movement more towards actually privacy enables innovation because it enables individuals to take control and individuals have more data. And therefore, if you take a proactive stance, you'll be able to do more with data. So we'll see that shift that goes together and that's a developing shift. 
sometimes called my data, sometimes called Internet of Me, those sort of terms will become more widely known as businesses are saying, okay, data is now more widely available through data portability. How can I use that as new entrants come in? And again, that is going to be happening worldwide. On the slight downside of that, there'll be some confusion. Um, inevitably, this is a whole new business area that is opening up for everybody in the ecosystem. And there's going to be lots of different solutions touted for that as to how individuals do take control, as to how businesses do access that data. And that will sow some confusion through the year, undoubtedly. Um, I would estimate that by the end of the year, one or two solutions will start becoming more obvious than others. Uh, it's probably too early to say exactly which ones they are. But we'll see a big movement through the year, fundamentally around the world, to individual control, businesses coming to individuals for better data, and not just in the legacy things of social data, for example, and purchases and a bit of location, but all across the ecosystem. So health, um, we're gonna see a massive changes in health. Uh, governments are already um, suggesting that their individuals should own their health data, and that's the way forward to solve the problem of ever increasing cost, is if we take more care of ourselves. Finance, we've already seen open banking and that in the UK, PSD2, Europe, and that's moving around. So actually, although we have privacy legislation going to be happening around the world like GDPR, it's very similar, we're actually going to see a greater use of personal data, but a more respectful use, a greater use across the spectrum, but more respectful, more involving the individual. So I think it's very positive. Um, but you have to be prepared to understand what does that mean? How can you access this new, very rich data set, but do it in a way in which you're meeting the legislation for informed and explicit consent? Okay, well, if, if GDPR um, uh, has been one of the big talking points, without doubt, for, for MEF community in the last year, the other one has been RCS. Um, one of the predictions that came in from Robert Gertzman, who uh, sadly was unable to join us on the call from CLX, was that 100% of MNOs would be voicing their support for RCS next year. So maybe, Dario, I can ask you what, you what your thoughts are on the rollout and support for RCS in 2019. Yes, and um, let's be controversial uh, to, to, to a point. Uh, voicing, yes, but launching, no. Uh, we're going to see a lot of uh, positive feedback of an RCS, and we're already seeing that now. 2019 is the make it or break it year for RCS. Uh, the industry should coalesce and find loan sum of services specifically on the A2P, which is where money will be made. Um, are all of the operators ready to launch? And is Google also ready to support them? The answer is unfortunately no. So we know that and we have discussed. We recently re released a, a, a paper from, from MEF uh, with Tata Communication, Anam and Rocco, a survey. And that showed that worldwide, 26% of the mobile operators will probably be launching, let's say in 2019, which is a big number. Um, it's a big number and we'll have to be uh, looking country by country because a very important element is if you've got all of the operators in Germany, if you've got all of the operators in Spain. Actually. Now, that probably will be what needs to be done and tracked by the uh, players in this area. Where can I launch? Where, where is the market ready? In 2019, already starts with a, a couple of places with a very good position. We know Japan is, is actually one of those countries where you could. We know that uh, effectively 2019, uh, with Verizon expected to add We'll also have the USA uh, completely covered. And we talk to the operators and we understand that in quite a few countries in Europe, we're going to see that. So a very good starting point. So I was trying to be fictitious here. Obviously, the, the, the prediction from, from Robert was about voicing uh, their support. And I think that, that is probably true. There's going to be a, a large amount of talking about Mobile World Congress. But more importantly, because there's been a lot of talks in the last few years, we're going we're gonna to see a lot of doing this year, doing on RCS. 
That said, <clears throat> and MEF uh, is, is a forum where we get the entire ecosystem talking, there's a lot of things to be resolved, there's a lot of questions to be resolved. So also 2019, we'll see a bit of the ironing of the issues that need um, to be dealt. Overall, I think it's a very positive and very interesting uh, year for RCS. And once again, if RCS will make it or break it, we'll see it in 2019. Okay. Okay. So Andrew, um, you obviously somebody who knows a lot about mobile messaging from your, um, uh, your past. So maybe you can give us a little bit about your thoughts on the rollout of RCS. I don't know if you can comment on whether you think Apple will um, commit to the, the, the channel in, in 2019 as well. Look, it's very difficult ever to anticipate what Apple is going to do. Um, they, in many ways, they are like a gigantic global operator all of their own, with such a large market share that they can make the weather. The, the, the SMS taught us that the great power of any kind of communications medium comes with uh, ubiquity, comes with the reliability that you can communicate with more or less anybody without them having to be a member of this scheme or that scheme. The operators, when working together, are in a tremendous position, um, supported obviously by Google, uh, to make that happen across a large segment of the market. But the truth is that as long as Apple punches a hole in that, it's going to hobble RCS. And that may very well be the deliberate intention um, of Apple, who have other plans for the market. Um, so, I know, Rafa, do you want to. No, talk my two cents on RCS okay. would be uh, well, you know, messaging is really big in Brazil right now. Uh, HUP is growing a lot as well uh, on SMS. And at the same time, we've just gone through this uh, really historical moment where we just elected a new president that didn't have any time on TV. So all of his campaign was based on mobile messaging. Uh, he got more audience uh, talking with people on WhatsApp than on TV. Uh, and in his uh, one of his speeches last week, when when he got his certificate of being a president, he mentioned that democracy can now be uh, a direct relationship and engagement amongst uh, citizens and its president because we have mobile messaging. So, if RCS is still not a focus for anyone working on on this industry, uh, it definitely should be because uh, more and more people are used to talk uh, through messaging and not just call. Uh, yeah. Actually, calling is not a, a habit these days. Uh, it's actually awkward to call anyone uh, any time of the day for any specific reasons. Uh, the main, the first thought whenever your phone rings right now is why, why is, is someone calling? Yeah, that's true. Uh, <laughs> like, this shouldn't be happening anymore. Uh, so we're seeing like at the same time uh, carriers searching for uh, new revenue streams and, and not just focusing on this and just keeping this space open for new new entrants uh, and, and companies like uh, Facebook, Google, Apple and others are of course thriving uh, at the same time. But uh, this all depends uh, if companies have 4G, in, in a country like Brazil, uh, which is massive in terms of territory, and we only have 4G in like a thousand cities out of the 6,000 cities we have, uh, we, we just know that uh, WhatsApp doesn't work all, all over the country, uh, and other kinds of messaging don't work all over the country. So this RCS and other, tech, other technologies that create uh, new you know, and innovate somehow on the SMS space, uh, would be more needed than ever. Okay. So, um, having talked about RCS, um, which is obviously tomorrow's messaging channel with luck, um, when we're talking about today's channel, which is SMS, which happily for everybody, um, there's been a huge increase in A to P traffic over the years. One of the big issues around that has been fraud, which obviously the method is very deeply committed to eradicating that. Um, a prediction for next year is that we'll start to see um, really significant drops in SMS fraud. So, Dario, maybe you can comment on um, how that decline might take place and how dramatic might it be? Sure. And uh, I'd like to claim there that MEF is, is part 
of the solution here and uh, not just for the, the industry body but as a representation of all the things that are happening in the different part of the ecosystem so the last few years i've seen the operators working together with the aggregators the software solutions even the enterprise and the finance uh, finance companies trying to address the, the, the key issues would have been some type of, of, of uh, the fraud from spam and the gray market routes for instance which is largely being addressed i would say but all in, at least in, in some markets. The, the coming up with a new code of conduct from a math really probably crystallized some of the efforts in the industry to try to clear up some of the known issues in there. There's a lot of other uh, issues, fishing being probably one of them. And even there recently, there's been an announcement that in UK, both uh, the associations of the, the banking the financial industry the uh, the uh, regulator of um, for the telecommunication services together with the operators and MEF have been working together uh, on finding a verified ID solution to avoid phishing um, and that will probably really see the light in 2019. So we have quite a few important building blocks at different levels at different if you want development stages but the overall trend is a very positive one and to link back to RCS as well. And that has been one of the key issues that have been uh, associated with the differentiation of SMS with some other other services. It should be it's, it's security, it's uh, operator country by country, regulatory uh, overseeing, etc. So I think what used to be in the past, one of the big fallacy, one of the big issues of the messaging world has been turned around and trying to reposition SMS and RCS as a, the most ubiquitous and secure solution mechanism to delivering OTP services. And to, to mention some of the discussions, Rafa, probably to, to conf, control and confirm that it's your candidate talking to you and not somebody else or another state sending messages that are not regulated. So all of these things are probably a bit one step closer in, in SMS than in the majority of the messaging solution worldwide. Rafa, but what do you mean your experience in Brazil of, um, <coughs> of the state of SMS fraud? Well, right now it's under control. Uh, we've been probably since 2000, 2013, we've been uh, simulating carriers to implement fraud uh, tools to, to tackle it. Uh, we are now like most financial institutions, insurance companies, like uh, big relevant companies in Brazil, they don't use anything that is not through a large account uh, right now. They, well, we're still seeing a lot of phishing, especially in banking. Uh, like I've got <laughs> during this weekend, uh, three phishing messages, but you could see uh, fast enough that they're phishing because they're using long numbers. Uh, we've, we have uh, tools to where users can basically send phishing messages for the carriers so they can block the, the numbers and, of course, involve the authorities when needed. Uh, but right, we, what we have right now is like more sophisticated fraud coming in because of that. So uh, it's just not, not long numbers trying to fish uh, information, sensitive information from users. Uh, we've had uh, cases where a uh, short number was masked and, and frauded and, and used by a, a third party that is not the, the real company. Uh, and we have, uh, of course, carriers aware of that. So what we have right now is uh, two major carriers implementing new tools. We are in the verge of discussing with them uh, how good are these tools and if they are somehow uh, causing any harm to the ecosystem as well. because if those tools just block too, too many messages, uh, then we don't know if they're working for sure. So right now we are on like uh, basic tools to, to secure uh, users and, and tackle fraud are implemented, uh, probably because we started uh, five years ago. And during next year, what we're seeing is new tools that taking into consideration user behavior, uh, artificial intelligence, and that's, Probably some kind, some way of using machine learning as well 
uh, not just to stay on the long number, short number equation, uh, but and on the volumes, but other things as well. Uh, incredibly enough, what what really really happened and and diminished fraud by forty percent was uh, creating this uh, total number of uh, messages that a, a phone number, a long a long number, uh, could send at once. So and create levels for that. So. Since fraudsters try to send a lot of messages at once, uh, they now have limits on, on how a, a user number can send in terms of mass, volume of messages. So that helped a lot. And it was quite simple to implement. Well, um, the MEF just recently published a report which suggested that um, the sort of easier to solve fraud was on the way down and that um, more sophisticated frauds with a problem. Um, Andrew, is that your perception of where the market's at now? Yes, I think that's right. I think it's important to divide between the use of SMS for what you might call social engineering attacks, which is a, a well-worn path in the email world and which uh, the combination of the operators themselves and the industry acting in concert coordinated by organizations like MEF uh, can uh, is in a very is in a, in a much better position uh, to combat, and clearly there's always a, a bit of a cat and mouse game as the industry acts to stamp out one form of malpractice, so the the, the, the fraudsters invent new methods of social engineering. But as I say, the industry is in a much better position to um, to combat these sorts of attacks uh, than was the correspondent than was the email industry um, and, and and is the email industry today. We have to distinguish between the social engineering attacks and the real cybersecurity frauds, uh, because there are still tremendous vulnerabilities within the mobile operator environment and within the legacy SMS environment. Um, a few years ago, not very many years ago, there was a tremendous scandal when the US uh, standards organization NIST, in their 863 report, uh, basically told the US government to stop using SMS one-time hard codes as a security measure. The, the roof fell in, there was a great deal of discussion about it. That advice has now been um, not exactly withdrawn, but very significantly mitigated because it was clear that there were some things that could be done. I think that the SMS-based uh, SMS -based security measures will continue to come under uh, attack and it's very difficult to defend against those sorts of sophisticated cyber attacks. And ultimately there are limits uh, to the degree to which um, SMS can be relied upon as a means of cybersecurity. That doesn't mean that um, protection against uh, social engineering frauds cannot and will not be made uh, very effective indeed by the concerted action of the industry. And I'm enormously proud on MEF's behalf at the work that it's leading uh, to combat SMS phishing in the, United, in the United Kingdom initially. But I think actually we're going to see this initiative, once it's been proven successful in the UK, spread to many other countries. All right, so um, a big topic for 2019 is, and for many years ahead, I'm sure, will be artificial intelligence and machine learning and some of the ethical questions around that. It's becoming a big part of the mobile landscape. So, Rafa, um, maybe you could talk to us a little bit about um, the kind of the f possible um, legal measures to protect people um, when AI and machine learning becomes more prevalent. Yeah. Uh... So what we've been facing right now is uh, some scholars and specialists are starting to ask on how to actually develop artificial intelligence that is fair and not biased with, to, towards its users. Uh, at the same time, the amount of artificial intelligence applications uh, is growing every day, uh, mostly for uh, new applications that we don't actually imagine. Uh, and we are starting to see people getting worried about it. Uh, what we are not seeing still is uh, legislators legislator and regulators, congressmen, uh, they still don't have the slightest idea of what artificial intelligence means. Uh, we could see last week at the Google hearings at the American Congress, uh, how, how, is the, how big is the, the, the gap 
between legislators and technology right now. This yeah. isn't different from other countries as well. The same happened in Brazil, uh, the same happening in Mexico, and the same happening in Europe, uh, and probably the same is happening in Asia. So the speed of things and, and the speed of uh, the development of artificial intelligence, intelligence right now uh, creates uh, this and expands this gap uh, amongst who should and what should be regulated and, and what is actually being created. So I think the tool for, for that right now, uh, as we are seeing in some uh, universities in the US and, and some organizations in, in America uh, and here in, in Latin America as well, is how do we actually create some, some minimum ground rules for artificial intelligence development? Uh, what are the ethical uses of it uh, and what are specifically what are its limitations because right now we are on this uh, open ocean uh, where people can just create anything they want uh, the consequences of such creations are still not well uh, matured so we are still seeing a lot of errors and we are working uh, like kids uh, on this big big important tool to, to our futures uh, of course, we we believe competition uh, will solve this uh, in the long term, but at the same time, uh, users are really worried. Uh, and the MAF Consumer Trust uh, showed some parts of it. Uh, we are, we are, are seeing other uh, surveys showing that users are afraid of the impact of artificial intelligence as well, and they really don't trust uh, that all players are creating artificial intelligence tools with uh, like all of the consequences of all of the ethical and legal consequences in mind all the time. So we are more of a, on a state of trying to see if it works uh, than trying to see if it's fair. So what we're going to see during uh, 2019 is still a lot of uh, conflicts arising between uh, users that feel somehow threatened or feel somehow used it in a bad way of speaking uh, with their data and somehow the, the applications of artificial intelligence uh, getting towards conclusions that users somehow don't like uh, and it starts to get strange and probably by the middle and the end of the, the next year we are going to start seeing companies uh, working and grouping together to, to, to try to steer this uh, towards a more ethical path and trying to create uh, limitations on what is actually forbidden, what is actually a no-no no situation and what can be done. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I don't believe this is going to be uh, tackled by the government or lawmakers uh, <laughs> this is going to be in the hands of the industry itself so i think um, a similar question mark would be around um, iot which is another area which um, analysts predict will be huge but does actually present a lot of ethical um, security questions um, a prediction for next year um, which the panel came up with was that there will be some kind of major IoT data breach uh, in 2019. There have already been a few. Andrew, maybe I can bring you back in here. Um, what are your thoughts on the rollout of IoT and um, the potential for some kind of serious data breach in 2019? So I don't know whether we're going to see a, a serious data breach in 2019. Um, I, I fear that um, careless IoT is a little bit like climate change. You know, you can you can get away with certain practices for a period of time, but what you do is you create a growing environmental hazard, which sooner or later is going to get you. And the number of break or the number of ways in which uh, in which um, uh, poorly implemented IoT can cause really cataclysmic cybersecurity breaches is quite horrifying. And there aren't any very good solutions. Uh, out there, there are some ideas, but none of them have really been adopted. The, uh, and the, you have a you have an accountability problem. That is that 
devices can be devices that are being supplied by company A to person B can be used to attack uh, entity C without A or B suffering any consequences. And that makes it difficult for A or B to take things seriously or to spend any time or effort protecting the C. So you've got a classic coordination problem. And I think it will be increasingly the task of industry bodies, governments and regulators to, to, to work together to come up with approaches that actually can secure the environment. The real challenge is that there is no consensus yet upon what those approaches look like. So I think we are still in the phase, metaphorically, of belching CO2 into the IoT atmosphere. I suppose the uh, one potential solution to what you're talking about is that we, that the sort of smart things ecosystem is controlled by one or two companies, whether it's Google or Samsung or, or whoever. But then, of course, that raises a whole other issue, which is that we're entrusting everything around us um, we're in the hands of one single private company, and that's no large. Problem. Large economies, large economies have structures specifically set up to prevent that kind of thing happening, and it's called antitrust. Doesn't always so work. I think if there was, ed I would think no, but I suspect that uh, uh, that kind of level of concentration, if we actually saw it beginning to appear, would be jumped on from a great height by mm. company by by governments who can see the noxious social consequences um, of that kind of control, which leads to all sorts of other issues. I mean, we see the backlash. We, the nearest we've got to that is in, face, is in the, the massive dominance of Facebook in the social arena, and we're starting to see the tremendous political backlash against that. So I think that, I think that there will be significant action to try to limit that happening. Okay. I think it requires coordination and regulation. Yeah, yeah. So I think the final um, topic we want to touch on is a sort of resurgence in voice as um, a strategic play for, for the mobile ecosystem. It's kind of been overlooked for the last few years, given the rise of messaging and apps and so on. But now we're starting to see voice activated devices and search, um, whether it's Echo and so on, and some um, the, the idea of voice for payment, voice for authentication. So. Dario, briefly, maybe you can finish off by telling us a little bit about your thoughts on the, the kind of return of voice as a strategic play in mobile. I'm very glad. As a matter of fact, I love the idea that we can finish off with a, a, a positive news for, for 2019. As you were saying, it all started on voice and mobile telephony was voice. And then it all disappeared and we had the usability of the touch, the applications, everything else, but pretty much the, the text in itself made it exciting. Um, we've forgotten about voice as, as a medium and only recently, thanks to the assistance, we've seen a reemergence. Now, the big shipments we were seeing right now for the echo of this word, for the, the different uh, speaker, uh, from the, the, the big Apple and, and Google and Amazon of these words, that is creating a completely a new field. And if you were working on voice at some point, or if you have a voice services, you're now seeing a research and a, a new great opportunity for remarket your services. So very good news for the industry that we are now dusting off a bit some of the old services. And these, plus the evolution that we'd expect in terms of all the things you mentioned, Tim, as well, would create a fantastic uh, opportunity for the customer as well to uh, engage with content in a different way. All right, thank you, Dario. Um, I think that brings us to an end of our um, brief look into 2019. So thank you, Rafa, Dario, Andrew, and Julian, for your help. And to everybody watching, um, have a happy Christmas, a prosperous new year, and we'll see you in 2019. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.